All right, you're good to go. Hi, everybody. Molly says we're good to go. So welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Molly's at control tonight, and she's the one in charge of making sure that it all comes out all right. Um, and we have Bob Traub with us tonight. He's going to tell us about uh, processing comets using PixInsight. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Ah. Someplace or another, I'm getting feedback, Molly. So. All right, uh, hold on. Uh, I don't know where. Alex, you, see, you probably have running. You're probably running the video in the background. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's coming from my end. Uh, let me see what YouTube people are saying. There. Alex, it's you. Yeah, I think it's you, Alex. <laughs> okay, so if I just go ahead and talk, I'm just going to go ahead and talk and take it from there. Uh, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel, everybody. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about what's coming up in the very near future. So I'm going to go to present Here's it now. Here's my call, Alex. Hang on, I'm working on it. You can see just saying that they're hearing it. <laughs> um, let, me, let me see if I can hear it. Um, tonight, I want to take you back uh, uh, about Sunday, May 3rd. Brian Clements talked to us about the upcoming comets and how to process them. Um, the comets that we've got coming up, um, it wasn't um, the big comet that we hoped to have when Comets Atlas was coming through. I felt the need to get some comet processing in. Comet uh, Atlas died on us and didn't show up the way it was supposed to. But uh, we've got some other ones coming up. And by then, I had arranged a couple of people. Bob was here, or Brian was here, rather, uh, on May 3rd and told us about comet processing for those of you who use Deep Sky Stackers and uh, Photoshop a lot. And uh, tonight, Robert's going to tell us about uh, uh, processing with uh, Pixed Insight. Next week, Richard Wright's going to be back. Um, the Fusion is a new product from Software Bisque, where it puts a whole lot of stuff together into one compact unit that controls uh, your telescope and helps you take pictures all night and things like that. Um, uh, we have some other people coming up uh, over the next few uh, months here, and uh, we're, we've got good schedules coming up all the way until July, so please take part in that. We are always looking for presenters, so please, when you're on, on the astroimagingchannel.com, please, um, you can look up all our past shows here and you can see all the different things that you're missing. You can also go straight to our YouTube channel and see that. Also, use the contact button, tell us who you are, and if you've got any comments, tell us. Most importantly, if you'd like to volunteer something with us, please go ahead and volunteer. Okay, with that in mind, I'd like uh, Bob Traub, I, uh, you about ready to go take over? I'm all set, whenever you are. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, you've got it. Go ahead and share your screen. All right, let's go there. That sounds like it looks like it's working. I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Um, there's still Thank an echo you. on the stream, and um, it sounded like it's coming from somebody's microphone instead of from uh, the normal um, that we had in the past. Um, so I'm trying to sort that out. Uh, Alex, I guess it couldn't be you since you're wearing headphones because uh, that wouldn't make sense. Um, Okay, I don't hear it anymore, actually, so. It probably was me. I probably had another instance of YouTube running. Yeah, okay, okay. I think we're in the clear, so uh, go ahead, Bob, take it away. Okay, let's uh, get into this. As as folks have said, my name is Bob Traub. Um, I am an amateur ast astrophotographer. I've been doing that for about 20 years, 15, 20 years. Um, spent 25 years in the Air Force, retired. I was in space and missile programs at that time. And that, that interest has kind of carried over into my civilian life, uh, my civilian hobbies. Uh, started imaging about 1999 or so, 1998, 99, 
with a camera and film and all the problems that that entailed and have sort of slowly progressed to um, other other tools which I use. Um, I'm going to start my presentation now and we'll see if we can get this thing running. If you will tell me whether you can see the the the, uh, the, the presentation, I'd be happy. You're good. Okay, good. Um, as I said, I've been doing this for quite a while now, and I'm a, I'm a NOVAC member. I belong to the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. Um, we have about eight or 900 members. We uh, promote ourselves as being the largest observing astronomy club in the known universe. That may or may not be true, but that's who we say we are. Um, NOVAC has a, a pretty good website, and I have my pictures, a lot of my pictures, posted on their member image gallery. And you can see, I hope you can see the, the, um, the website there. It's www.novac.com. And once you put that in, you go to observing and you'll see members' images. So this is my presentation to you guys. Um, it's going to be based on, on Warren Keller's book, Inside Picks Insight. Uh, this is on the second edition, the, the, um, the comet processing section comet technique section was updated slightly in second edition if you have the first edition there's still a lot of useful information in there so i highly recommend getting one of the two and um, the process that i'm going to talk about the process is i'm going to talk about are described in that book on page 319 or wherever it happens to be in the version you have <clears throat> um, as was mentioned earlier there are some pretty nice comets coming up um, some of them have died, like Comet Atlas, and we'll just talk about that in a second. But this is an image from Terry Lovejoy, and Terry has a lot of wonderful images on his Twitter, Twitter page, Terry Lovejoy 66 on Twitter. Um, but this one shows in particular the growth of Comet Atlas over time. Started on March 1st, was pretty much of a fuzzball, and a couple of different images he's taken about 10, about 15, about two weeks later, he had a decent image of the comet with a tail. And one thing you'll notice on these images, back here on March 1st, the comet was pretty far away and it wasn't moving very quickly across the sky. And then as the comet got closer, the comet itself was moving at a, a moving more quickly across the sky. And so the star trails are getting longer. And that's one of the problems we always have with processing comets. Um, you wanna take a picture of the comet, but the comet's moving. So you can either stack it on the comet or you can stack it on the, on the, on the stars. But until recently, it's been very hard to do both. Um, unfortunately, Comet Atlas has started to, to break up. This is from Terry Lovejoy's site, but uh, Massé and Haig have, have, were taking these images. And you can see around April timeframe, it started to break up. And then finally, the Hubble took a picture of it on April 20th and it was actually able to separate the different parts of the nuclei as it went through. So while that offered a great deal of promise, it wasn't it didn't turn out to be as good as we had hoped. However, uh, cometwatch.co.uk has a list of currently observable comets. Comet Swan is brightening. It's it's in the morning sky. It's pretty close to to being near the horizon as the as the sun is rising but it's still currently still far enough away that you can pretty get get a pretty decent image of it this is an image that rolando legusti i probably butchered his name rolando i'm sorry legusti legusti uh, took back on april 13th so it's if you can get an image of it as it's rising in the morning um it looks like it's getting better it looks like it's going to be worth it um coming back to this list Comet Panstars. I took several images of Comet Panstars on the 23rd of May, which hopefully I'll get a chance to show you in a little bit. But it's it's uh, moderate moderate brightness and it's up all night. It's actually circumpolar. Right now it's near the uh, right now it's near the uh, Big Dipper. This is a comet. This is a picture that Pete Lawrence took on May 1st of Comet Panstars. And if you look at where it is tonight, this is this is tonight's image. You can see that it's just off the handle, just off the front, just off the pointer stars of the Big Dipper, and of course it'll be it'll be moving in this direction. Well, not of course, just happens to be moving in this direction as the as the uh, as the month goes on. You can get this um, an interesting link at skyatnightmagazine.com, and they'll talk to you about various things, a lot of advice and skill sets. But one of the things they offer is how to see and photograph Comet Pan Stars T2. 
D2 Pan Stars. So it's a, a good reference to go to if you can if you can um, find the link. This is an image I took on May 23rd of Pan Stars, and for a guy coming to show you how to process comet images, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed because I'm not happy with how it came out. Um, I'm getting some trailing on the, on the head of the comet here. But it was an interesting evening because it was near M81 and M82 and an NGC object here. Um, I'm gonna process it some more and if I, if I get a better image of it, I'll, uh, I'll post it somewhere and let you guys see what it can, what it can look like. So how do, you, how do you capture a comet? Uh, first of all, you look and see what's up, and the references I gave you are, are, are pretty good. There's some good references on heavensabove.com. Um, but my recommendation, my suggestion is if you can, if the comet has a tail, frame it such that the tail is in the field of view and, and that you capture the whole thing. That's sometimes hard to do. Um, this is a simulation from Sky Safari. And it's, it's again, tonight's, tonight's image, an image from a simulation from tonight. But Sky Safari is a bit of a problem. Sometimes it, it overestimates the tail of the comet. So here I have this thing framed in, with my TAC 8580Q and a Canon 5D Mark II, which is what I took those other pictures with. And it looks like the tail of the comet is gonna, gonna take up the whole length of the, of the image. But in reality, it, it didn't. It was, it was more along the lines of about that big. But you gotta start somewhere. This is where I started and this is how I decided what, what uh, camera ca camera and telescope combination I wanted to use to start this with. Um, you always got to plan. So if you can, plan to frame it and get your camera orientation in such a way that you get the tail of the comet. It makes for a much more dramatic image. In my experience, uh, well, maybe because my lack of my monochrome imaging is has very limited experiences, but my most of my images were done with a DSLR, one shot color. That simplifies the processing because you don't have to worry about comet shift during this changing of the filters. If you do use a monochrome, I would recommend, assuming you don't have focus problems, that you go RGB, 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 as opposed to red, 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 green, 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 blue, blue, blue. That'll keep the color shift down and it'll allow you to make um, uh, better, better shots uh, of, uh, of a colorful uh, moving image, colorful moving comet. But again, my choice was to use my DSLR. In order to capture the comet, it's basically similar to any other deep sky photo, which if you're listening to this channel, you probably have some experience with. If you want to set it up on a tripod or an ASL mount uh, for wide field shots, just remember the, the rule of 500. You take 500 and divide it by the focal length, and that gives you roughly the number of seconds that you can take an image without the image, without the stars trailing significantly in the image. So if I have a 100 millimeter lens, I divide that into 500 and that gives me five seconds, a, a, an image of five seconds, a sub of five seconds long, should leave a very minor, minor trailing of the stars as the, as the Earth rotates. Um, in that long, you're not gonna find comets moving very far, so the comet itself is gonna blur going to be mo a motion. In fact, you can take longer images. The ones I took were five minutes and I did not see any motion of the uh, the comet, um, blurring of the comet, elongation of the comet, because the comet's pretty much an amorphous, amorphous uh, object. But again, 500, rule 500 is a good way to get a, a rough start on how long you should take your shots to keep the stars from trailing. Uh, if you're able and, and have an equatorial mount, I would recommend going a good polar alignment and starting your auto guider. If you can auto guide on the stars, your images will come out much better than if you, that if you, than if you can't. Um, I'm not much more about to say about that. As I say, that's typical of most deep sky images that you take. To process your images, you're gonna need to do all the calibration steps, flats, bias, darks, and all those other things for post-processing. And you wanna do all that post-processing before you start your uh, comet, comet, comet alignment, comet processing. Recommendations for exposures, um, I'm not gonna make any except for this, this uh, ASL mount rule of 500 thing here. Um, it bends on a lot of things, comet brightness, the amount of sky glow, the sensitivity of your camera, and all those things that you have to play with when you are processing a deep sky image. So it'll, to a large degree, it's, it's luck, but more than that, it's experience. So just keep, 
keep trying to take some test shots and see what comes out good for you. In general, more exposures are better. Now, since comets are moving in a, in a moving sky, in a rotating Earth sky, uh, sometimes you're limited about how many exposures you can take. Uh, you want to make sure it's up high enough above the horizon to start without getting too much um, uh, ext extinction from the, from the atmosphere. But then again, if it's setting towards, or if it's rising before sunrise, then the sun's going to start rising, the sky's going to get light. So you're kind of squeezed between that, um, between those two, uh, two constraints. Now, in the case of pan stars, there was no problem because it was up high in the sky about midnight. So except for the clouds that moved in later in the night, um, I could take as many as I wanted. More exposures are better. If you have lots of time, we'll talk about this tip in a little while. I would recommend, if you can, to press for time, don't worry about it. It'll, it'll work itself out. But if you can, pause between each sub-exposure. What PixInsight is going to do, as you align on the comet, it's going to treat the moving stars, the stars that are, that are in different locations in each of the subs, it's going to treat that as, as noise. And it's going to be able to um, um, filter out, not filter out, process out, reject the stars because they're not in the same place in every image. So if you can leave space between the sub exposures, leave time between the sub exposures, um, that will put the stars in a, in, a, in a significantly different position on each of the subs and the, and the processing will process it out. It'll reject the stars as noise. There are some settings you can use to, 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 to help that along and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, the question is, how long? How long should you pause? The answer, if there is one, is that you want to pause long enough for the stars to move off the pixels that they're currently on. So you want to, you know, move the diameter in arc seconds of a star. Now, on your image, they, they have they have dimension. In reality, they don't. But in the image, they have dimension. It's it's a tough thing to to figure out. Motion, the the, the actual motion is available on online motion of the comet is available online or on the sky safari app so it'll and others i'm sure so it'll tell you how fast this the comet is moving across the sky now usually they do it in per hour or per day so you have to do a little bit of math to figure out how many um how many pixels how, how much how many arc seconds it's going to move um but again try it and see try some shot test shots see if it see if the comet if the comet moves far enough then when you align everything on the comet the stars are going to be moving um, if the comet is nearby the comet's going to be moving pretty fast across the sky relatively speaking if the comet is far away um, it's going to move pretty slow and and of course if it doesn't move very much you're going to need longer pauses as i played with this concept trying to get ready for this i realized that sometimes it just it just doesn't move enough and there are ways to get around that, and we'll show you how to do that uh, by cloning them out a little bit later. Any questions before I move on in terms of capturing a comet and how to do that? I have one. Uh, just I was try typing it in, but you stopped rather conveniently. How about that? Um, you, you said that um, uh, while well, you're taking one-shot colors, because that's the smart thing to do with a comet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I, I think I th I agree with that. Having some experience with it, um, I, I can see why you'd need to pause for that. If you're taking LRGB, 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 do you still want to be pausing? I would suggest that you pause between sets of LRGBs. So you take an L and R, a G and a B, and then pause a while, and then LRGB and pause a while. Um, you want to make sure because you want all those those different colors to be stacked at the same location to be found at the same location on the image for each of your each of your subframes, and then you want to pause to let the comet move to a different location and then take some more L R G and B images. So you, so when you were finished, you wouldn't stack the L's together and the R's and the G's and the B's together like you usually do. You would stack you. You stack L, R, G, and B from that particular group at once. Um, I was hoping to avoid having to get 
And I was hoping to avoid having to talk about LRGB and, and monochrome image processing. Then let's, then let's do it. Let's let's but, go through the presentation and come back to it if we have but, time. But later. let me also say in Warren Keller's book, in the section that talks about common and it talks about common integration, the common alignment, it does in each of the different steps. It talks about what to do if you're using a monochrome image. For example, when you're using the image integration step of the process, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll just read it. Frames were taken with a monochrome camera. You'll need to integrate each filter in set independently. Choose the appropriate pixel recognition algorithm. And it, it gives you little phrases like that, little sentences like that for each step of the process. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing LRGB, if you're doing monochrome imaging, um, perhaps the, the, the Warren Keller's book would be very helpful to help you yeah. understand how I, best to do that. I did, in fact, use Warren's book when I was processing mine. Good. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Eric, do we have any others out there? No, I think people are still listening. So okay. we have a lot, a lot more to cover. So here we are. This is a schematic, a diagram, a cartoon, whatever you want to call it, of a single subframe. And so you've got stars in the image and you've got a comet in the image. But if you take several subframes and stack them up and align them, register them on the stars, you'll see that the comet moves over time. So this is the first step in the process. I'll talk about what those steps are later on. But this is the first thing you're going to see when you align. You do a star alignment, uh, PixInsight star alignment on the on the stars. You'll see that the comet has moved through that time. Um, this is a picture taken by Chris Shore on March 29th of Comet Atlas, and he and he he says that this is a 45 minute exposure. Well, it's not a, a 45 minute exposure. We know from our experience and how we take long exposure long uh, speed based shots we take several exposures but he's taken nine separate exposures for each probably about four to five minutes and you'll see when he stacks all of these images up on the head of the comet you'll see the stars in fact fall to a different place on each of the each of the subs that he's taken and it's that separation that we're looking for if we can get it we're looking for that will help us uh, process those pictures, process those stars right out of the image when we align it on the comet. That helps us make the comet master. So here is here's the entire process from start to finish of creating the the the, the image with the, with the um, uh, create uh, processing the image with all your subs. First of all, you want to take all your subframes, apply your flats, darks, and calibrate those all of those images and save them. Then you want to take Using the star alignment process, you want to register all those subframes on the stars. Save all of those stars so that they're registered. Um, the first step you want to do is use the comet alignment process. That's the key one that we're talking about. And what that'll do is it'll it'll sense you tell it where the first comet is, where the where the first where the comet is in the first picture, where the comet is on the last picture, and then because it knows the time each picture was taken, it can detect on what pixel in that frame they should find the, the head of the comet. So when you integrate that, basically you're taking all of those subs and you're creating a comet master. Let me go to the next slide. It'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Here we have more traditional processing where we've stacked all of the images, all the subs up on the head of the comet, and you can see that the stars are trailing. In this particular image, you see that we've stacked them up on the stars and the comet is trailing. There was a bit of a pause between the first group of comets and the second group, but PixInsight doesn't care. It knows where each it knows where each of these images, what time it, each of these images were taken and where the star is on the on the image. And, and PixInsight keeps track of that for you. We'll demonstrate that in a minute. So once I've got that and I've done my, I've, I've processed PixInsight as we'll show you, we then come up with a comet master here with just comets, just, just the comet. And we come up with a star master, just the stars. You see there's some residual in here. That's uh, that, that's gonna happen and you can process that out and, and you can filter more of it out if you if you're, sensitive with how you what your settings are but basically these are the two comet master and star master that i used to create this common picture of f 46p worknet comet i've got some residuals and i should probably go clean some of these things up but basically that's the comet this one had no tail at the time that i took it 
All right, so back to our process here. We do the comet alignment process to align all the, all the images on the comet, and then we image integrate to get rid of all the stars, and that creates our comet master. Again, I'll show this and demonstrate that in, in a few minutes. Uh, another schematic of that process. Here we have all the images, I'm sorry, have all the images aligned on the stars. I basically, using PixInsight's comet alignment process, I identify the location of the first star, identify the location of the last star. PixInsight calculates the position of the comet on each of the subframes at the time it was taken, and it aligns all of the subframes on the location of that comet. So here we are um, now. We've aligned those all on the head of the comet. You'll see the stars that were in the field originally have now moved, and we can now filter, not filter, we can, we can um, uh, process those out and reject the light from those stars, reject the stars on those images. And, and it, it does that automatically once you start this process. And then it basically erases the stars. And now we have the Comet Master. It's, it's pretty ingenious, I think, how it does that. Um, but we now create the Comet Master and we save that image. We'll use it again later. So this is the process we had. Now we'll go into the second phase where we use these same processes all over again. We use the comet alignment process, but this time in one of the fields in the comet alignment process, we add in that comet master. Whoops, let me go back to that. We add in that comet master, and it basically now will subtract that comet, subtract the pixels, subtract the data from that comet's pixels, that image's pixels, each one, to remove the comet from each sub subpixel. We then use image integration process again, and we've wind up with a star master that you save. So here is, uh, the, again, the cartoon. We have the original original images with aligned on the stars. We have the comet. We identify, we, we put the comet master into the subtract field of the, of the pics inside comet alignment process. And it subtracts that data from each picture. So it, it, you identify the first and last, and then it basically steps through each one and it removes the comet from each of those pictures. And you're left now with a star image, with, with an image with just stars on it, and you save that with some additional processing if you if you want to. But you basically stay, save that as your star master. Then you pick the star master with your stars, and you add in your comet master with pixels. You add in your comet master using pix, in, pixel math, rather. You combine those two together, and you're done. You have a clear, sharp stars and clear, sharp uh, comet. You're done. This again is the same one you saw before. It's coming a kind of picture of Comet 46P Workman. This is the one you saw before. This was difficult because what's happening here is as I'm trying to create my Comet Master, the stars are rejected, but these objects are not rejected because they're, they have light on more than just the pixels they're in. So th this was, I still have not, I'm still not happy with how that came out, but I've got a nice tail. And I've got uh, sort of a muddy looking comet head here, but it's basically there. And if I, uh, if I am energetic and conscientious, I might, I might get a better picture out of it. This is a, comet, a picture of Comet Lovejoy. Again, the stars are, are uh, relatively finely defined and the comet is finely defined and you can see it's got a nice tail. Now, one of the problems with this image is when I did my, when I did my Comet Master, and I tried to get rid of the stars, it left a little bit of residual stars um, on the image. So it basically is, is uh, looks like it's moving in the, in, the, in the sky and it shouldn't. Ideally, I would just have pictures of the star and, and, the, and the residual of the stars would, would disappear. That can be a problem. I mean, that can be alleviated by, by prudent choice of the, of, the, um, of the parameters in the, in the, in the uh, image integration tool. Um, but basically, I'm pretty happy with that. You see, I had a dust donut in here. I'm not going to talk about that. Well, I just did. Oh, well. Um, so my suggestion is use the delay. Uh, this creates a, uh, and, and basically facilitates star rejection. So before I move on to the demo, any questions on how this process works? Uh, there are no questions, Bob, but apparently some people over on on YouTube have tried that process with uh, good success. Yeah, it, it can work really well, especially if you're talented with PixInsight. 
I have to confess, I'm not a, a real good PixInsight processor. I don't do it very well. Um, my my past history is using Images Plus and, and Photoshop CS3. Um, so it's I, I don't do PixInsight really well. I've kind of focused on this process because I really like Comet Pictures and I've gotten some good results. But um, if you're good at PixInsight and you can reduce some of that some of that, well, I'll call it noise. It's not noise. Some of the unwanted signal uh, from some of those intermediate steps, the Comet Master and the Star Master, you can get some really wonderful results. So if there's no other questions, I'm going to transition over to PixInsight. Now, when I started processing, I'm going to do, I think it's I'm pretty sure it's Comet Lovejoy. When I started processing Comet Lovejoy, I had 28 images. And 28 images are just too long to process here. So um, if you'll recall, the first thing we do is we start with registered images. So I'm going to open up, um, let's see, let's, let me just show you what I have here. So I have, these are my, these are my original images. They're not aligned. They're, they're not, they're, they're, they're in the immigrant, um, calibrated, but they are not aligned on anything. Um, yeah. So what I what I then do is I will align, uh, I will register those using star alignment. So these are the these are the images that I'm going to use. And I only chose six out of the 28. Number one, process time. Number two, they're nice and separated. So the process has a better chance of working. So I'm going to start on comet alignment because I've got. Oh no, let's start on blink. Blink is a good good place to start. You want to use blink to make sure that what you're what you're using. That what you're using is in fact that the process you just just started it does in fact did in fact work properly and that you've got the data that you really really want that, that to start forward. So here we are. Uh, Blink, of course, does a, a stretch for you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a brief delay, and I'm going to step through each of the six images. So you can see each of these six, six images are aligned on the stars, and the comet is moving across the field of view. Okay. So I'm convinced now that, that these are the ones that I want to use. So I'll stop that, clear it, and I'll go to my alignment comet alignment process. I want to add the files. I am now in the registered section. So these are the ones that I just showed you. These are the ones that are registered. I'm going to open it up. And I'm going to put the put the files in a I'm going to put files in a folder that is under that is uh, under the, that basically that are comet aligned. Because what I'm going to do with each with these, I'm going to align all of these pictures on the comet. And the way I do that is I double click on the first image. It has to be expanded. And I want to zoom in. And I'll put my cursor on the head of the comet. And I'll press the button. So it forms a circle around the head of the comet. I don't know whether you can see this on, on YouTube or on the, on the screen. There's a, a bigger circle that, that circles the centers the, the head of the comet. And in the center, there's a smaller circle. I don't know if this will help or not. Probably. You can see there's a big circle that stays the same size and a smaller circle in the center of it. So here we have the first one. And you'll notice down here under parameters originally these were zeros these were all zeros but because i have identified where the head of the comet is on the first object the first the first image it now knows where on that image the head of the comet is located so i want to do the same thing for the last image i want to stretch it and zoom in and i want to put my cursor over the head and there we have the second image identified, second location of the second image. And now it knows where that one is located and it computes a rate. So it now knows how fast the comet is moving 
from this position to that position. Whoops, I just moved it. There we go. So now it knows, uh-oh, that's not the same numbers as before. I'm going to start this over again because I think I just messed it up. Uh, 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 oh, sorry about that. Okay, there's the first one. There's the second one. Okay, that's better. Now, once you've done that, you can actually close these images because you don't need them anymore. So now I have uh, where I want, the, want these comet aligned pictures to go. I have the parameters. I don't want to subtract anything from these, so I'm going to leave that field empty for now. Um, this interpretation, I I found that the default version is is just fine. So now I'm going to process that and have all of those images, all six of those images, aligned on the head of the comet. Once I do that, we'll be able to use Blink to to um, find the numbers to make sure I got what I what I wanted. <clears throat> but now instead of registered, we're going to go back here to comment aligned. I'm going to open those up. <coughs> Excuse me. And now we're going to look and see that all of these images are now aligned on the head of the comet and the background is moving. So in fact, each of those stars is moving. But the comet and the tail of the comet, which you can see in a couple of these images, I hope, is basically the, in the same location on each image. Stop that, clear that. So we're now basically done with comet alignment for the first time. We'll come back to it later. And now we wanna use the image integration. Let me see if I can go back to my PowerPoint slide and show you this chart image we did comet alignment and now we're going to do image integration in order to make the comet master so i want to add these files that i just aligned we're on comet aligned i want to add these files open them up um, the default version of image integration seems to work fine uh, might work better if you use a use a median scaling but i've never haven't really tried that very much so we're just going to use a default of average but what becomes critical, not critical, becomes important is how do I reject the pixels that, that contain stars? If I have a lot of a lot of images, I can use Windsor Sigmarized Sigma, Sigma Windsorized Sigma clipping, or I can use the, the new one that just came out a couple of versions ago, uh, generalized extreme student even. I'm gonna use Windsor Sigmarized <laughs> Windsorized Sigma clipping. Uh, I'm gonna reject low, low pixels, I'm gonna reject high pixels and I wanna create a map. Um, so that's basically the first time. You can experiment with these with these different ones. If you hover on it, you'll get some help about what each of these things do. Um, most of that is beyond my, my understanding. Now, what I also heard read in the book and also found is that when I'm doing this for the trying to get rid of the stars, I want to get put my sigma high down to the lowest possible level. I'm gonna put it down to zero and we'll see what happens. The rest of these are all pretty good. Um, this has to do with your CCD, and I don't play with that at all. And the rest of these basically are not relevant. I'll show them to you just so that you know there. But basically, they're not. We don't have any structures that we're trying to get rid of, and we don't have a region region of interest. So let's get that processing. Now, what it's doing is it's taking each image, comparing it to the others, and looking at the each the stack of six pixels, and it's trying to identify outliers. If there's a star in one but not in the other, that's considered an outlier, and so it basically doesn't include it. If there's a head of the comet in all of them, then it basically does include that as it stacks these images. Hopefully this will be done in a couple of seconds and we'll go on. Couple of seconds and we'll go on, right? <laughs> okay, here we go.
And you probably noticed I had a significant amount of green in these images. To be honest, I'm not sure where that's coming from. To basically process it out with a stretch, with an STF, uh, non-linked STF stretch. <laughs> Or you can use other. Oh, it doesn't seem to hurt this process to have it still still be in there. If you unlink okay. your um, STF channels, then um, it it'll do a better color balance. That's right. That's right. And you can yeah. do that now. If we're gonna, in fact, why don't I do that now? Well, I can't do that now, but we'll do that now so that we get rid of the green. I gotta wait till this is over. Um, while we're waiting for this to be over, I might mention that if uh, it's in the second edition, I, I, is it also in the first edition of Warren's book? I don't remember, but I was using the second edition when I did mine, and the steps are just as Bob is describing them. They're just sitting right there in the in the book, and the you know, yep. you can look I'm, it up, and there they are. I'm not real creative when it comes to pics and sites. <laughs> uh, STF. There we go. So we're going to unlink that and we're going to stretch it. So now you see the comet is still there. We've got the head of the comet with a nice nucleus coma around it. We've got some detail in the tail, but we've also got some residuals from the stars. And those residuals, when we combine the star image, the star master and the comet master, those residuals are going to show up. So what I'm going to do, and this seems to have worked in the past, uh, it's clone stamp. Oh, can't do that. I gotta get. I gotta get. Close that and close that. Process. No. Close that. So I, I click on that. Now I gotta choose a radius for my clone stamp. I found a large radius works better because you get less. Um, 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 residuals, less less sharpness. But I also reduce the sharpness and I reduce the opacity. So if I look at this image over here, that's going to be a rough image of what my clone stamp is going to look like. I don't want it to have sharp edges because that'll show up later on. So I'm basically, you push control, that tells you where you're going to clone from, and then just erase it, start erasing it. Clone, you want to get somewhere that's approximately the same background brightness. I'm going to increase that to a little bit higher. Increase the radius to a little higher. And I'm just going to basically gently try and remove some of those, some of those background images, some of the stars that didn't get deleted. This is a little tricky because it's close. And I can do it. This one's tricky. Now let's get rid of this one. And you can spend as much time or as little time as you want doing this. But this one's tricky because it's in the tail of the comet. And I don't want to erase too much of the tail. So I'm kind of cloning the back half of the comet tail to this part of the comet tail to get rid of those stars. I could work on that a little more, but I, I choose not to. So then choosing the check mark, I apply it. If I didn't choose the check mark, those things would all come back. Can I now I want to file. Go ahead. Um, we have a question uh, from, from John. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> He's no asking, uh, some of my comet subs get bad satellite trails. Uh, what do I do about gapping the comet head? Um, the comet, the, co the satellite trails should just process it out should just process right out when you integrate them, both the star, you know, integrate the star or the comet image. They should just disappear. Um, so tell me, read me part again about the comet head. Okay, some of my comet subs get bad satellite trails. What to do about gapping comet head? I'm not sure I understand the, the, mm. the term gapping sure. the comet head, but I per, could perhaps, say yeah. naming the, the comet, the, the satellite trails going through the comet head. Yeah, maybe it's in that bright, bright halo area. I'm yeah. not sure. But, yeah. I don't think there's much you can do cloning-wise to get rid of anything that's happening here because the brightness is changing so rapidly. If I were to try and uh, clone something here, it's it's not going to work because you're going to you're going to have brightness Poss difference. Poss possibly cloning it in one of the subs 
prior to stacking might do that because that would be better yes yeah. And and also remember when Bob was going through the parameters to set up for image rejection while he was doing the image integration process, um, he got down to the bottom there and says, well, I don't have a lot of structures. I have to worry about things like that. That is one of the places where you can address satellite trails. Mm. Those structures, so st the, the, those big structures like that. Um, uh, th that's the structure. That's okay. You know, you know, it's fixed insight. So instead of saying satellite trails, they say large structures. <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's good the way it is. But that that will help. But it's not a cure all. Okay, yeah. just write I've your never, congressman and tell him no more satellites, please. I've never tried that. All right. So we've we've saved that we we haven't saved it yet, but we've we've uh, done all the processing we need to. There are some residuals here that I'd like to remove, but I'm not going to take the time to do that. So I'm going to save this as, and where I happen to where I save it is I save it in the same place that the comet aligned uh, images were, and I just call it comet aligned. Uh, I just call it comet aligned so that I know. Uh, that that's the file that I want to come up with and use later on. Okay. So we're going to close or reduce that, put it over here for later. So now let's go back to here. We've now made our comment master. Now we want to run the comment alignment, alignment process again and image integration again to create the star master. So we want to open up process, uh, all processes, comment alignment. Okay, we still have the same registered files that we had before, and we can look at them and, and check and make sure if we want that the comet head is aligned. We can open that one and we can check and make sure that the comet head is still aligned on there, and it still is. If it wasn't, or if if for some reason you this is this is empty because you hit reset or something, you can go back and do that again. We can delete these. We want to make sure the output now is going somewhere different because this, these are going to be aligned on the stars. So we want the output to go to the star aligned. And what we want to do is we want to subtract the comet image. We are now in the comet aligned. There's my comet aligned master. Actually, I should, I should call that comet master, but it's called comet aligned now. I usually call it comet master, wasn't thinking. But that's the one we want to subtract from each of these images. And since it knows where the comet is on each of the images, it can just take that data, take those data and subtract it. Um, what, what Keller's book says is you can play with, play with don't, don't need to play with enable linear fit, you can play with normalize. I've tried that and it, to me it just comes back very noisy and very pixelated and I, I avoid doing that. Um, I've played with reject high, reject low, um, I don't, this seems to be in a good place. I have not done too much, not too much success with playing those, uh, changing those values. You, you guys may have better success than I, and it also depends greatly on the comet image, uh, how much movement there is and other things. So now what I'm doing is I'm creating a series of images based on the registered star images, but I've subtracted the comet, subtracted the data that represents the comet. From each of the each of the images, star aligned. This will run for a while. Any other questions while we're waiting? Okay, guess not. No, we're good, Bob. Okay, that's great. I've tried several variations on all of these settings, and with a couple of exceptions, the, it depends. It depends greatly on the on the images of the comet, which how much motion and things like that. Um, but most of the time, this, the the um, the default images work fairly well. For your comet, for your processing, you may want to try changing some of those images, but most of them work pretty well. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to open up. The star aligned images, these are all new. And blink, and we're going to see what happened. 
Now, at first glance, I'm usually very disappointed <laughs> because these are star aligned images. This is the first one. These are star aligned images that had the comet removed. But wait, you say, the comet's still there. Yeah, it, it is. It looks like it's still there, and it truly really is. But both, but the data, the intensity of the comet has been reduced significantly from the original data that we saw, um, and that's that's going to help. Uh, when we create a comet master, we can get rid of some of that. But basically, what we we've done what we what we wanted to mostly. At this stage, you can go back and reprocess it with different um, different parameters. But I basically is that basically is the process. Now we want to go to uh, that's the other one. Okay, we want to go to image integration. We want to clear these because that's not the one we want to add. The ones we want to add, we want to go to the star aligned file and open that. So now we want to go to image integration again. These things worked pretty well for us last time, I, my opinion. Image rejection. We still want to use Windsorized Sigma clipping. I don't know if there's a bad effect or a good effect from choosing a different rejection algorithm. I just leave it. I always just leave it the same. Um, Windsorized Sigma clipping is good for if you have 10 to 20 subframes. Right. Uh, linear fit clipping is great for 20 or more. Um, and I've, I have seen that using um, the other Sigma clipping, the not Windsorized one, is good for fewer than 10. But I personally pref uh, I haven't liked those results as much. Uh, so I always use Windsorized for fewer than 20 subs. An argument, an argument could be made that um, I should have used percentile clipping because there's only six images. And, you know, that would that would, might have worked better. I don't know. Um, but in trying all this stuff out, Windsorized Sigma clipping worked for the batch of 28, and so I just kept it here too. It might not have been a good idea, but we'll see. Okay, so um, I've left this at Sigma, left this at zero. Um, so we'll, let's just see what happens and see if it comes out okay. Again, we're taking the the uh, six images that we that we aligned on the had aligned on the stars and removed the comet. And now we are um, integrating them to create what we'll eventually call the Star Master. Sounds like a character in a movie. I copied everything to my to my uh, C drive, which is a solid state drive, and I've got a i7 with eight processors, and so this is running as fast as I can make it go. <laughs> But it is what it is. Anybody got any good jokes? <laughs> <laughs> I should I should cue the Jeopardy theme uh, to to play from my machine. <laughs> yeah, Bob, could you um, okay, review the equipment? the equipment that you used oh, uh, to gather the information good question um let's see this is lovejoy so i used a uh Osamani g11 mount gemini gemini uh computer i had a, a tech 160 apo refractor and of course i used a 5d my dslr which is a 5d mark ii and you are you are guiding on a um uh, star yeah, using a, a S big auto guider, um, um, and I put a, a single star at the center, and it's guiding on that. Uh, your exposures are how long? I honestly don't remember. I can look that up. Hang on. Nope, can't do that there. Uh, let me answer that question later if you don't okay. mind. Yeah. Okay. We're finished processing now. And so now we're going to expand this. And since we stretched it before, you can see this the star field and the comet tail has gone. We still we're still left with a bit of residual in the head of the comet. But when we paste the regular comet, when we paste the star the comet master back in, that's all going to be overwritten. 
So it's it's really not going to cause a significant significant uh, effect. So now I, I'm not even going to bother to clone that out because I'm afraid I'll mess up some of the stars and leave some residuals. So I'm just going to save this in the star aligned folder as star master. Okay. And now I'm going to minimize that. All right, going back to our presentation, we've got the comet integration. We've subtracted the comet, we've integrated it, and now I've saved my star master. So the only step left is to pull these things over here, and then we're going to open. Oh, here it is already. Pixel math. All right. I'll just open that. And we want to integrate that. Plus, now had I renamed these properly, those one would say star master and one would say, um, you know what, I can't do that this way. I'm sorry. Come back here. I tried this before and it didn't work that way. So I'm going to try it this way. And I'm going to parse that. It's okay. What would I do to parse it? All right. So now I want a destination because I don't want to overwrite it. I want to create a new image in the same color space. And it has now done that. I'm going to expand it. So now you see that we have a star image and we have the comet image. We have some trailing tails. Um, this obviously can need, use, use a little um, pixel insight magic for in terms of de decreasing the background, bringing out the subtleties of the, of the tail. But here you have a, a non-trailing comet on its field of stars. And basically, we're done. And again, PixInsight is um, Pixin. There are a lot of a lot of tools of PixInsight that I'm not as good at others as others are, and so I'm going to leave the others to, to figure out how to do this, you know, to get this picture looking better. But basically, this is done. Now, this is with um, this is with eight images. Oh, that's the same one. I have another image somewhere here. No, nope, that's Lovejoy. I mean, that's a different one. All right, so somewhere. Um, All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna give up. Basically, what I was trying to show you is that this image, when I used all 28 images, I think I showed it to you earlier. When I used all 28 images, this, the tail becomes much more prominent. This is faint because I just used the six. So let's go back to here. This is the demo. Um, this is an old old image of Comet Lovejoy that I processed. This is this is the um, the same comet we've been processing, but it's comet processed in a more traditional fashion. You can see the stars are trailing. Um, there it is, what I was looking for. Um, this is an earlier version that I processed earlier of what we just did. Six sub exposures processed. Um, if I use um, all 28 exposures and then subject it to uh, picks in sight, maybe a little bit of CS3, a little bit of a little bit of Photoshop. Uh, probably overdid the head of the comet. Ba basically, you can see that the, the, the details of the tail come out better. In this particular instance, I left a fair amount of star trailing in. Um, it, it's you know just lack of experience in how to get that done well. Just as a, a little fun tour, these are some other comet images I took. 
This is Comet Hartley 2. I, unfortunately, I don't remember the date. It was around 2015 or thereabouts. And you can see a line on the star as the comet, head of the comet moves. This is the one I just took the other night on the 23rd of May. You can see the comet. It's aligned on the comet. You can see the stars are all trailed, but so is the uh, so are the galaxies. If I put on top of that the one where the stars are uh, uh, aligned on the stars, galaxies come out okay. And I even get a little little um, uh, satellite in there, but the head of the comet is is trailed until finally when I put it all together, I get good galaxies, good stars. And I still need to do some work, admittedly, still need to do some work on the head of the comet, but basically the tail is there. Um, going back to Hartley too, I, I did a couple of things and in terms of processing it, I used an average combine and you could see the aligned on the head of the comet and you can see the comet looks good, but the stars are trailing. I did a median combine, the comet looks good, but most of the most of the stars have gone because of the median combine. If I did a, whoops, if I did a, alignment uh, alignment on the stars that the head of the comet combined and if i did alignment on the stars and a meeting combined the head of the comet literally disappears and all i get is the coma so that was a fun exercise this is probably one of my first astro astrophotographs i was at a golf course down in fredericksburg on a on a barn door mount that i made uh, and, a, and a camera on film took a picture of halley's comet and i was quite happy with that comet catalina as a, an anti-tail, the two tails that looked pretty good. Uh, Comet Ison, those had some great, once again, had great promise, but on Thanksgiving day, it went around the sun and disintegrated. And this is pan stars, uh, two uh, different pan stars, but back in 2018 or so, uh, working in which you saw before. All right, um, I'll ask questions right now. Um, before I do, let me just show you what I'm gonna provide. Uh, and I'm not sure how to do this, I'll get some help, but basically I have, four slides that step through the process that I just described. Comet Master Part 1, Comet Master Part 2, where you wind up with a, where you save a Comet Master, Comet Master, Star Master Part 1, and Star Master Part 2, where you wind up with a Star Master, and then you use Pics and Sight. So these four pages basically describe what we just went through. Are there any other questions? Uh, Bob, there was a comment about using a Comet filter. Okay, um, I'm trying to remember what the constituents of that filter on. I, I, I've heard of it, I don't remember what they're for. I think anytime you can suppress uh, background light, anytime you can suppress starlight, especially if you're not trying to take pictures of the background stars, the comet filter won't do that very efficiently, but it should reduce some of it. Um, I wanna say it's a cyanogen filter or something like that, I forget exactly, but. Um, it should help you bring out some of the some of that type of gas that's in the in the comet and help you see the comet better. Yeah, there was a comment from Milwaukee. Hmm. If you uncheck enable linear fit and normalize okay. in comet alignment when doing the star master, uh, you might have better success if it in subtracting the comet. I'm not sure about that, but that's what the person said. What he's referring to down here is when I'm trying to combine all these things, either to subtract the comet, the, the comet master, or just align all of the images on the head of the comet. What he's saying is if I experiment with enabling linear, linear fit and then and, and, uh, checking normalized, it can give you different results. Uh, it says in, in Keller's book that really you don't need to, to, to play with enable linear fit. I believed him, so I didn't try. But when I tried to check normalize, everything came out very grainy. It, it either it created a lot of noise. Um, and I'm not sure because that's whether I had really dim subs or what the reason was. But um, it, I, I've not had success with that. You know, it's one of those things like picks in sight. It gives you so many options and there's there, time is the only constraint. If you want to play with those through, it might work for your individual comment. Might be better. Can't tell you one way or the other. Uh, I have one comment to make uh, about the images I've taken of the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, producing the comment master in Pix Insight is really quite excellent. Yeah, it's a it's a clever process. Yeah, it's a clever process. Something that we could probably not do ourselves. I've usually come back a day or so later. 
and taking an image of the star field. Yeah. That's a cheat. Then, then just put the comment where it was, yeah. which is basically what you're doing without all the fussing of, you know, removing the comment from the images. Yeah. The, 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 the clever technique is that it has figured out how to subtract the comment from each of those images, each of the subs, uh, and then you integrate it. Uh, it doesn't seem to do that 100% efficiently, but um, it does work. And because it seems to do that in such a way that the residual comment gets overwritten by the comment master, it doesn't seem to affect the, the final image very much. Um, but yeah, I, I thought about doing that. I probably might have gone out tonight because it's here in Virginia. It's very clear. Um, but I had other prior engagements. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Bob? Oh, while you're reviewing that, um, and I, I suggest everybody get their last questions in because we are getting near the end of the show for the day. Um, I wanted to say that um, Bob did a great job here, I think, of, of going through the process and explaining why we do those kinds of things and how we do those kinds of things. And, you know, th that's, that's great. It sounds... Like there's a lot of steps, a lot, a lot, a lot of steps. Actually, there aren't all that many steps. There is a difference between difficult and intricate. Uh, these are steps. And you take this step, and then you take that step, and then you take that step, and then you take that step. And really, it works out very well. If you follow through Warren's book or I, those four pages, I believe, um, that um, Bob showed us towards the end of his presentation um, are pretty much, I think, uh, along the same lines of what Warren has in his book. If you follow that, just follow it. You know, don't ask questions. Just do it. <laughs> and you'll probably be OK. It does make things a whole lot easier. I think if you follow it and a couple of times to and do it a couple of times, you'll figure out places where you can make it better yeah. by by adjusting some of the sliders, by by cloning out things and not cloning out other things. I think it works out pretty well. This is the basic process that's described in Keller's book. And then down here, these are, are more detailed descriptions of what each of those steps mean. And I've tried to capture as much of it as I could. Um, some of it are probably pretty obvious, like how to choose a rejection album, percent clipping, Sigma Windsor Sigma clipping, and all that other stuff. But the documentation will tell you, the book will tell you, um, basically just follow through what those steps are. And um, as he says, it'll, it'll, it'll get you started. Okay, it looks like we've got all the stuff related to comment processing. I do have one more question about comment processing. Bob, at some point in this process, you have a picture of the stars that are all aligned, and you have a picture of the comet that is all aligned, and then you went to pixel, pixel math and combined the two. Um, and um, what would have happened had you processed each of those pictures uh, so that they were maximized. You know, you got the best tail looking tail on your on your comet picture and your best, sharpest, colorfulest stars, and then did the pixel math. I don't think there'd be anything wrong with that. Um, in fact, um, in, in, in Keller's book, he even suggests when you're using pixel math, um, you can sometimes use the star master and then two times the Comet Master if you want to bring out a fainter tail. You can do a lot of things with, with PixInsight, I'm sorry, with um, Pixel Math that will uh, help you with that. But what you're suggesting is do some more processing on the individual masters, the Star Master and the Comet Master. Well, um, what I'm thinking is a lot of people are now using StarNet to subtract your galaxies and nebulosity from your stars. And they're, 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 they're processing two different images and then they're bringing them back together i would think that you can do the same kind of thing with the two different um images the star aligned and the comet aligned yeah if you get a if you get a clean star master and a clean comet master pixel math doesn't care what you've done to it as long as it's the same size it'll just add them add them together and come probably come out cleaner yeah okay you know uh bob there's one more thing you can do during the process of developing those uh, aligned subs you can make an animation 
it's really quite easy to do it. Oh really yeah, using using blink. Um, using blink. Using blink. So once you have a star aligned set of images, you can export it as a video. Now blink may not uh, make the video, but it will make your subs that you can then use as an animation. Yeah, if this, you like to see your comment move through your this, stars. Uh, this this icon on Blink, we don't have any data in there, but this icon on Blink does actually create the video for you, assuming you have um, a certain program on your computer. And I don't remember what that was, and it's not telling me now, but you have to have... Um, FFmpeg? Yes. You have to have that on your computer, and that will that will allow Blink to create that animation for you. Well, here's another fun thing you you can do, Bob. Could you align? Could you put in the? Um, could you put the images back in there? The I think the original images, back in Blink. Oh sure. Let's put them in there. Now these are not the original. These are the star aligned images, but they're before any other process. Uh, and that, but the comets in there, right? That's um, correct. Still okay, and then um, you see where it says that point thirty seconds. Just hit that button, and that's a fun thing to do to watch your comet go through. And basically, yeah. the movie yeah. thing makes a movie of that. You right. just have to get that point thirty seconds timed out to where you can actually see it. And of course, if you've got twenty eight pictures of that, and it's just that much cooler. Works even better. That's right. Yeah. Now, as I say, I'm going to stop this here. Um, okay, it's this is. I'm just going to load it and see what happens. I haven't done this in a while. I did it for one. Well, that's a good place to try it on YouTube in front of 80 million people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, either brave or, I'm either brave or foolish. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is it going to work? Uh, run is the button you want to hit. Try, try, try run down at the lower right, yeah. Output directory, okay. You are certainly being brave, Bob. Well, I've got nothing else to do tonight. We definitely need the music in Jeopardy. Definitely what? You do, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I might do this. I'll have the recording set up in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have it ready to go for the next time. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's enough silliness. Uh, I mean, the the I don't know if we're going to get this to work or not, but um, I wanted to uh, share my screen here for a minute if I can figure out All how right, to do let's that. See if I can figure out how to get out of running uh, this. Thing. Oh, Bob Jobs presenting. So Bob, yeah, we gotta get out of here. Yeah. So stop presenting. Gentlemen and ladies, it's been a wonderful time. Thank you for the opportunity to do this. Okay. Stay here. Stay here. Right I'm here. not going anywhere. Okay. Um, now I'm sharing again. I am presenting my screen and I'm presenting to everyone. What would I want to present? Oh, I was going to present this to you. Um, hey, there's a lot of really cool things on our YouTube. Uh, I didn't, I usually do this at the beginning. Um, but I wanted to share it with you at some point. Um, we still need people to subscribe. Um, we still appreciate people donating. Okay. It, we do have some bills every now and then. We're coming up on our sixth anniversary. Next, uh, next show next week will be our sixth anniversary. So please go ahead and hit the subscribe mu uh, button if you can. We'd really appreciate that if you've enjoyed this program. And we'd really ask that you come back again next Sunday. Um, Richard Wright will be presenting on some really cool stuff that Richard Wright has, well, software BISC people, you know, all the BISC boys and and now Sarah. And then, uh, you know, the whole BISC team gotten together to, to manufacture some stuff that um, really cool uh, fusion product that um, uh, simplifies your imaging. Richard will be here. And of course, Richard's always one of the great presenters. So uh, see you next week. And thank you, Molly. We ready? Take us out. All righty. I'm going to play our little exit thing here. Just a second. Toka, uh, go. We have a Facebook page and a Facebook group.
you guys could go post your pictures on the Facebook. Uh, if you join the Facebook group, you can post your pictures over there for everybody to see. Okay. Thank you, Toga. Molly, 